the financial centers of the world. This is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. minutes into the U.S. trading day, Thursday, December 2nd. Here are the top market stories that we're following for you at this hour. You got some Apple angst. Uh, the company warning that suppliers, that the iPhone demand is actually slowing around the holidays. Is it a supply issue now turning it into a demand issue? And Biden has those winter virus plans. The president will announce new measures today as markets whipsawed over the last 24 hours on news at the first Omicron cases in the U.S. And here comes the oil. OPEC plus a will pump 400,000 uh, barrels a day in January. Market drops like a stone. We're going to speak to Jeff Curry of Goldman Sachs. From New York, I'm Alex Steele with my co-host in London, Guy Johnson. Welcome, everybody, to Bloomberg Markets. Guy, oil also kind of whippy. On the one hand, they're going to pump more oil in January. On the other hand, they do say they can adjust it if they need to. Yeah, it's an open meeting. That's where they're leaving it at the moment. But I think few people expected that this would be what would, the out, would be the outcome uh, of the OPEC meeting. Does kind of feel like the Saudis, who clearly haven't lost their element of surprise, Alex, have maybe done a deal with DC. We'll wait and see. You think? How, how do you figure it Feels that? like it, doesn't it? Does it? Well, I think, I figure, I, yeah, I, you had an SPR release. Um, we get this, this deal here being done in terms of it, adding extra, uh, extra barrels to the market. That feels like some, it's certainly going to prevent another SPR release, isn't it? It's going to leave OPEC in control of this process rather than having to worry about what's happening with the suppliers. Uh, and it does take the temperature out of this whole issue of higher oil prices. I don't know. We'll see. We'll debate that. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I agree with you on that one. This could get fun. We're going to talk to Jeff Curry uh, later on, Guy. Yep, we should certainly talk about that. I want to talk about the other thing that you mentioned in the headlines as well, and that is what is happening with Apple uh, confronting a new problem as the holiday season heats up. It's a problem that it hasn't really had to deal with for quite some time. It's had to deal with the issue of supply chains. Now it's having to deal with the issue of slowing demand. Yes, Apple and slowing demand. Uh, the giant's apparently telling its suppliers the demand for the iPhone 13 has weakened. Uh, and we've got a great chart here looking at the correlation between what is happening with Apple and the S&P. The news certainly dealing a blow to the tech giant's record-setting rally. Its correlation to the S&P now turning negative. We've obviously had uh, a lot going on in terms of the markets over the last 24 hours, the, the arrival of Omicron as well. Apple in some ways is a safe haven, but it's interesting that that may be starting to break down as well. Uh, so here to talk more about what is happening with regard to Apple's woes and how Omicron may play into that kind of story, consumer behavior, what's happening. Alex Webb of Bloomberg Quick Take, Bloomberg's Mike McKee also joining as well. He's our international economics and policy correspondent. Alex, let me start with you first of all. This feels like a big deal. I can't remember the last time that, that Apple talked seriously about slowing demand. It's had to deal with supply chain issues. We, we knew about that. But now, a demand slowdown? How serious really is this, though? Well, we did have a, they did issue a, an actual warning at the moment. This is reported from sources. Our colleagues are reporting this. They did have a profit warning a few years ago where they literally said that demand was not as good as expected. Yep. This here is really about demand catching up with supply. We already knew that they had perhaps reduced their expectations for what they were going to be able to produce because of the uh, semiconductor shor shortage. Sure. That means that it's perhaps getting harder for people to buy iPhones for Christmas or over the Christmas period. That demand is therefore getting pushed into next year. Now, the expectation was that it would be pushed into next year and it would arrive perhaps in the first half. As you get closer to the new iPhone, the iPhone 13, the one we have right now, wasn't a considerable upgrade from its predecessor. The iPhone next year is expected to be a more substantial upgrade. So it's got upgrade. to be good next year, basically. Essentially, it has to be good, right? That if that demand is going to pick up next year and you're going to have a real bonanza next year, again, assuming that supply chain can cope, you probably need to have a meaningful upgrade in order that investors don't start to get a bit skittish about whether this demand story can continue. Yeah, I'm also interested, it's so interesting how the market is not following Apple. I feel like that's a bit counterintuitive uh, to what we've seen. Um, hey, Mike, what, what struck me with this story is the fact that it could be a demand issue, not a supply issue. And I appreciate what Alex is saying is that it's a short-term thing. We're waiting for the new upgrade. But a demand issue is not what we've been talking about 
the last 18 months. No, it's not. Uh, but the question is, how does it break down? We really don't know. As Alex noted, uh, there were not the same kind of expectations for the 13 because it wasn't as new a, a, a breakthrough a product. Uh, but then on top of that, you layer the pandemic and the fact that people got lots of money and spent a lot of money on electronics in uh, 2020 and into 2021 in the first part of the year. So maybe uh, we've pulled forward some purchases of uh, electronics like iPhones that leave people not needing to buy as many at this time. Yeah. And then there is the supply chain question. We, you know, the, the Chinese have the, the no virus policy, so they have a tendency to shut things down very quickly. Uh, if we see Omicron spread there, then uh, that could cause more problems for the electronic suppliers. Mike, is there any chance that there's also an inflation factor here? that people are seeing price rises more broadly and as a result of which that maybe takes away some of their desire to spend money on discretionary items. Do I need to upgrade my phone or can I wait? You know, that's a very interesting question, Guy, because the iPhone came along in 2007 and since that time we really haven't had an inflationary question mm -hmm. and so it hasn't been thought of as a discretionary item. Now, Alex may have a, a, a better idea of this than me, but uh, People have thought they had to have these phones. Now maybe we're getting to the point where the incremental changes on the phones do become something of a luxury good. And if they are going up in price, people may say, I don't need that one. Right. And, uh, to, and to be fair, I feel like they forced you to upgrade. And I'm just getting mad about all that. Hey, Alex, well, what do you make of the fact that the rest of the market isn't rolling over on something like this? After yesterday's sort of really big sell off into the close for a headline that we already knew was coming and Apple down over 2% at one point earlier this morning. What's up with the rest of the market? What do you make of that? Well, perhaps some of the, uh, the trading on Apple has gone into other, other stocks. You know, Apple accounts for a huge amount of the... Uh, of the trading volume proportionally, uh, Apple and Tesla, I think, are the two biggest in the world. And I, I you know, I'm no markets expert. It wouldn't surprise me though if some of the trading is heading elsewhere. Uh, look, I, to, to Mike's point, I think that I, I personally don't see a correlation with inflation on Apple sales. We are, don't forget, still going to see a record Christmas quarter, record yeah. holiday quarter. It's going to be six percent. Um, analysts are expecting a six percent jump in revenue this quarter. If we were really concerned about inflation, I think those would be corrected down. Apple would ha be having to think about whether sales this quarter were affected. It, will it only encourage, though, Apple to think about services? It, it is a more predictable revenue stream. Uh, it allows them to uh, basically just generate an annuity. Uh, more and more people are flocking to Apple because of the services. Will this, if, if we are going to see maybe demand for hardware softening, will that kind of re-up in terms of the efforts that Apple is making? The key thing actually to remember with the services is that they drive purchases of the hardware. Right, so the services off. What we're talking about here right. is we're talking about photos, we're talking about music, we're talking about you know iCloud, we're talking about the App Store. The App Store, if you have um, games that are on the App Store and they require higher processing mm -hmm. power, that is encouraging people to buy higher spec iPhones. Right. If you've downloaded games from the App Store, you've bought, got your photos is that and music. the case with the 13? Is is, is I go, we all we all experience this. E Our kit slows down because the software gets better. It, it was the 13 a big enough jump to justify such an upgrade? There are still some games that, and there are gamers out there who do play games on their smartphones. There are some games and some features that run better on an iPhone 13 because it's got a faster processor. But the more stuff you, more services you get from Apple, the more keenly tied you are to those devices, the harder it is to trade it for an Android. It's, now, the upgrade yeah. cycle is a different question. That does seem to be slowing. Yes, 100%. Um, hey, Mike, last question to you real quick, and this ties into jobs tomorrow. We've noticed a distinction between uh, the jobs market and the confidence there versus consumer confidence. Consumer confidence rolls over, but confidence in the labor market holds up. Is this part of that story? Uh, you know, it's hard to separate all of this out. There's been a lot going on. Inflation certainly is an issue, and oil prices, uh, what you pay at the gasoline pump and what you're paying for food have been a major issue for people that depress their feeling about how things are going. When the stock market rolls over a little bit, too, people start to think, uh, oh, maybe things aren't that good. But then when you ask them about their jobs, their individual situation is pretty good. There are a lot of jobs out there. So uh, people are... are uh, kind of of two minds about this. And so the old uh, Alan Greenspan adage is probably the thing to watch. Uh, we watch what they do, not what they say. No, fair enough. All right, guys, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Alex, we have a Bloomberg quick take and Bloomberg's Michael McKee. Thanks a lot. We appreciate you guys. All right, coming up.
Investors bracing for December volatility. That's all due to the Omicron variant. Excuse me, we're going to be speaking with uh, Ethan Devitt, uh, Moneta CIO, who's joining us next on her take on what do you do over the next few weeks. This is Bloomberg. Well, markets rebounding after the biggest back-to-back sell-off since October of 2020. Uh, J.P. Morgan Chief Global Market Strategist says that Omicron could actually be a catalyst for steepening, not flattening the yield curve, rotation from growth to value, sell-off in COVID and lockdown beneficiaries, and a rally in reopening themes. I feel like I've heard this story before. They're viewing the recent sell-off in these segments as an opportunity to buy the dip in cyclicals, commodities, and reopening themes, and positioning for those higher bond yields. Well, joining us now for her take is Ethan Devitt, uh, Moneta CIO. Ethan, I've heard this narrative before for a while. So have I. Is it happening now? Is that the right call? I've definitely also heard it before. Uh, what we're seeing is the propensity to buy the dip. And why are we buying the dip? Because there's just so much money sitting on the sidelines. There was a statistic that came out last week that showed that the flows into equity funds this year were larger than the accumulative flows of the last 19 years. So clearly we have a large appetite for risk, a lot of money sitting on the sidelines that's just ready there, poised to buy into risk, which it needs to do because of the persistent low interest rates. Persistent low interest rates. Let's talk about that. Say we don't end up with low interest rates. Uh, say the Fed actually, uh, as some would suggest, and Bill Dudley is certainly in this camp, that we end up with rates significantly higher than where the market is anticipating. How do I position for that, even if it's a, even if it's a tail risk? That certainly does seem like a rather remote tail risk at this point, because what we've seen from the Fed and any central bank is a real hesitance around any type of tightening of any kind, um, even in the face of quite obvious inflation indicators. But how you do position portfolio is you maintain, you stick to the knitting, you maintain your allocation, your core allocation to fixed income. It won't have been making much money recently. It's in the portfolio as a ballast, as an anchor, as a form of deflation hedge. That's when that fixed income will start to come through when interest rates do rise. Initially, the there will maybe a, a little bit of a hit to that um, any existing fixed income, but it will ultimately be where you want to do. And that's actually maybe quite um, a, a problem for equities if we do see a steepening yield curve, because we'll see the rotation out of equities into some finally some yield in the fixed income area. Yeah, I, I, I'm really skeptical as to what would actually trigger that. I mean, you'd have to have the real yield actually move uh, more towards zero. Under what conditions economically do you think that something like that could actually happen? We'd have to see, I think, persistently higher inflation, much higher than what we've already seen. We haven't even reached 5% in the UK yet. We've seen 6.2% in the US. If we see repeated prints like that, then clearly the transitory narrative, which has been put to bed already um, by Chairman Powell, will, will well and truly be, um, be cast aside. And we will be looking at how to manage for a persistently higher inflationary environment. That, to me, is the only trigger I see. I see markets as still being fragile. They are resilient, but fragile. They've been resilient in the face of, um, of a lot of geopolitical news and, in fact, yeah, any kind of news that doesn't seem to move markets at the moment. They seem to be just wanting to go in one direction. But the fragility is what we see in the demand for bonds. Bond demand has not really subsided despite the low interest rates, which tells me there is a lot of desire to protect against and hedge against a flight to safety. So because of that, okay. the fragility... Well, let's just talk about that fragility. We haven't had a credit cycle. We haven't had um, companies going to the wall in a meaningful way. If we are going to see even slightly higher interest rates, what is the sensitivity of the credit market to higher interest rates? What is the sensitivity, particularly uh, at the bottom end of the credit market, to slightly higher interest rates? I don't think we have a particularly high sensitivity. What we've seen for very low rates of default in credit, unrealistically low rates of default. There probably is a desire, a need to normalize that and still for credit portfolios to stand up. Um, the reason those low rates of default did not were the case and did not come through is because we saw this artificial stimulus and a desire to kick the can down the road and simply extend, pretend, um, and, and not see, not, not, force companies to come to reckoning. So I don't actually see that fixed income is going to be that sensitive to a change in rates at the moment. Um, in the long term, yes. But right now, it's simply been circling around a somewhat unrealistic situation that's persisted. Mm -hmm. um, in the meantime, volatility is still picking up. Yesterday's price action was real interesting. Um, I'm wondering how seriously are you going to be taking the price moves now and the next few weeks as we're just sort of living off of these Omicron uh, headlines here? 
It's really interesting because this has come at the end of the year. We're coming off a year where records have been set in almost every month. And we've seen new highs been set in the NASDAQ and on the S&P. So as a result, even though these sharp bouts of volatility are surprising and certainly have sent a chill through markets, we still have a significant bank of equity returns to, to enjoy year to date. So I'd say that well, there will continue to be some profit taking, but also preparing for 2022, laying out the themes for 22, no, looking at where the portfolio needs to be exposed, maintaining that core exposure across both the stay at home stocks, as well as the, um, as, the, as the economy reopening stocks. And also, I believe, playing the theme, which is coming out of COP26, the focus on electric vehicles, energy, um, renewable energy, and, and the energy transition, that those are themes that I think will have a lot of legs as we move into 2022. Ethan, thank you very much indeed for your time today. We really appreciate your analysis. Ethan Devitt, Monitor, CIO, thank you very much indeed. Uh, next, we're going to take you uh, to Southeast Asia. The Southeast Asian uh, company Grab listing on the NASDAQ after completing a SPAC merger. Uh, it's now slightly down at around 11 bucks from the opening price of around uh, 13.06. Tan Hu Ling, uh, Grab co uh, Holdings co-founder, will be with us next. This is a delivery company. This is a transport company. Um, Think about Uber if you're thinking about what this business is like. We're going to find out what Grab does next. This is Bloomberg. So the Southeast Asian ride-hailing and food delivery giant Grab has gone public. It's done so in a $40 billion deal, uh, a SPAC deal, and is now trading uh, on the NYSE under the ticker, and this is appropriate, Grab. The company operates across 465 cities. It does so in eight countries. Joining us now, Hui Ling Tan, Grab co-founder, and Bloomberg's Emily Chang. Emily, over to you. Guy, thank you, Hui Ling. Thank you so much for joining us. Congratulations, obviously. Big day for you. You are a long way from those plastic tables you used to set up at gas stations to recruit drivers. As Guy said, this is a huge SPAC deal, one of the biggest SPACs of the year. Why SPAC, given what a tumultuous year it has been, and why now? Thanks for having me, having me back on air, Emily. Um, on your question, uh, we chose the path that enabled us to get to the most important objective first, which is to get the best investors for our day one cap table. And with that, based on our pipe investors that were attracted to the long-term growth opportunities that we've seen uh, and the very low redemption rates that happened during the DSPAC process, we are actually extremely happy with the outcomes that we've achieved as well. Now, it is a very, oops, sorry, Emily. You've turned Grab into a super app, including delivery payments, but also, of course, ride hailing. How worried are you about a resurgence of COVID and, and Omicron right now? So I think a critical part of Grab's growth trajectory over the last two years has been our super app strategy that has enabled us to be very resilient to the COVID challenges. Uh, to share a bit more about what it is, uh, think about Grab as Uber, DoorDash, and Venmo all in one. Now, from the, day, from the day when it starts, when you wake up all the way when you go to bed, you're able to get your breakfast, pay for meals, send your friend gifts, buy groceries, and more. And why that is really important is because it enabled us to have things like shared fleet strategies with our largest driver partner network in the region, which enables our drivers with their super apps to decide if they want to transport people, deliver food or groceries seamlessly in the app, and therefore enabled us to very quickly pivot from mobility to deliveries over the last two years. Now, with this super app strategy, we're very confident that we can continue to serve the needs of Southeast Asia's users and our partners, despite whatever challenges COVID continues to throw at it. Throw at us. All right. All right. Uh, still, though, losses widened to $988 million in November for the third quarter. Revenue also declined slightly. When do you expect Grab to become profitable? So a bit of context. A large portion of the last quarter's results were because of non-cash expenses. There were more than $700 million of it, much of which will actually no longer be required with the DSPAC that we just went through. 
Now, for us, the other important thing is that growth and profitability are not mutually exclusive. And you've seen that consistently from us over the past few years, where we've consistently developed very high top line growth while also making very significant progress on our bottom line profitability. For example, our mobility segment is already segment a bit positive with market leading mar margins. Our deliveries business, which is a very young business, only three years old, also is a bit the segment positive for various markets that we have. Ultimately for us, what matters in our portfolio allocation strategy is that we will continue to invest into areas that we see huge, tremendous opportunities in and very strong momentum behind. So Southeast Asia is one of the fastest growing economies in the world, one of the fastest growing digital economies in the world. Where do you see the most growth coming from and what new areas do you see Grab investing in? A great question. So the two key areas that we're very excited about, the first of which we endearingly call ACE or anything you can eat, where we're expanding beyond our food deliveries businesses to include things like dining, takeout, and also groceries when you're thinking of cooking home. Basically, we want Southeast Asians to think of Grab whenever they're thinking about food. That's one area. The second important area is financial services because in the region, six out of 10, South, uh, six out of 10 Southeast Asians are still unbanked or underbanked. And we see a tremendous opportunity to use technology to make financial services more accessible and affordable. For example, right now, we provide critical insurance coverage for our driver partners for as little as 10 cents per ride. Ultimately, as you said, it is a huge growth opportunity in Southeast Asia. Our core businesses alone have a total addressable market of $180 billion by 2025. And that doesn't even include our newer growth areas and investment areas like digibanks and groceries. Good evening. It's Guy in London. Thank you for staying up so late in Singapore to talk to us about all of this. It's fascinating. Um, Emily and I were talking to Uber a few days back and Dara was talking about his latest idea, which is to look at the logistics industry, basically creating a marketplace for drivers of trucks, etc. I'm wondering if that's an area that would be of interest to you as well in your region. So for us right now, what we have is the largest driver delivery network in the region. And that to us is the logistical backbone for Southeast Asia that we believe can continue to support the e-commerce growth that the entire world is seeing. So for us, uh, it's very much still focused on our driver partners and delivery partners. And we look forward to seeing what Dara uh, continues to build as well. Hey Ling, hi, it's Alex here in New York. Um, Emily mentioned and asked about uh, the resurgence of the new variant, uh, Omicron. And I wondered if you could give me sort of what you're noticing on the ground. Are people staying at home more? Are people going to work more? Are the, uh, can you give me an idea of how the chessboard is being set right now? Alex, it's a great question. And to be honest, it's a bit too early to tell. Um, we ourselves have not seen any particular changes yet, but the days are you know, just early, so maybe over the next few weeks, probably some of these trends will start to become live. What is Grab's strategy in Indonesia, Huiling? This is obviously a huge economy, and you've got go-to there, established homegrown tech competitor. Um, you know, what is the plan to take them on? So Indonesia is our most competitive market, and it's a market that we actually entered uh, relatively later. At the same time, we are already uh, the leading category, uh, category leader in the market in all of our core businesses, mobility, deliveries, and e-payments. So um, for us, what has enabled us to do this is a couple of things. One, our continued partnership with local um, partners like MTech who have enabled us to continue to serve local SMEs in different ways that we were not, not able to before. Two, our continued partnership with our local government partners. Um, for example, during COVID, when things were very dire, we, together with the government in Indonesia, actually set up more than 50 vaccination centers to try and encourage recovery. And this is really important to us because one, 
when the country is doing well, we do well. And if there's anything that we can do to build this continued trust that we already have with them, uh, that will always bode well short term and long term. Um, beyond that, I think our deliveries market and our category leadership there is a really important one that we're going to continue investing into and that we're quite excited about. And the super app strategy that I talked about earlier, where we have shared fleet strategies and local hyperlocal technology uh, investments that enable us to really have strate strategic advantages that are really difficult to replicate are things that we'll continue uh, building on. Guys, thanks but so Emily, much. Uh, so we have to leave it oh, there, sorry. but that was a really great conversation. We very much appreciate it, Hu Ling Tang, uh, Grab co-founder. Thanks a lot. And Bloomberg's Emily Chang, thank you as well. We appreciate that. Grab stock uh, now trading at 10.56 at 11.01 uh, was the SPAC IPO price. All right, well, we are one hour into the U.S. trading day. Powerful rally right around the highs of the session. Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle is here with what's moving the market. And I made this point before, Apple's lower, stock's still higher. You know, I'm amazed by that, Alex, because you typically wouldn't see that because we do have the S&P 500, to your point, a very powerful rally up nine tenths of one percent after a brutal two days for the S&P 500, the worst since October of 2020. And yet its biggest component, its biggest weighting Apple down 2.9 percent. Typically you would not see that. But the correlation on Apple and the S&P 500 is broken down. So yesterday Apple was actually at an all time high. So a little bit of an evening out here. Some of the top point boosts for the index. On the other hand, Visa and JP Morgan Chase. This, of course, as yields are higher. But one of the big stories on the day, oil. Take a look at this intraday chart of oil. Super interesting. It had been higher. And this, of course, uh, after having been down for two days, the worst November, the worst month since March of 2020, selling pressure having to do with fears around the uh, variant, economic demand, of course, the strategic reserve release. Uh, and then you see today a big, big drop lower. This, of course, as uh, it was said that uh, OPEC Plus will be holding with their output hike in January and then off of the low. So it seemed like investors just needed that news to finally come out. Not such a surprise given the fact that OPEC Plus, there had been some posturing that they might do that in uh, response to the reserve release. Nonetheless, you still see oil is below that 200-day moving average. We had this kind of action guy uh, early last year, at the end of last year, I should say, weaving around the 200-day moving average. It'll be interesting to see if that's what's going to happen or if it's going to be more dramatic and along the lines of 2020. Right now, it looks more like some healthy consolidation around that 200-day moving average. Abigail, it's going to be our next subject. Thank you very much indeed for setting it up for us. Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle uh, on what's happening in the markets right now. We're going to get more on those moves related to the OPEC Plus meeting. Uh, we'll do that with Jeff Curry. Jeff is, of course, Goldman Sachs' global head of commodity research. That is coming up. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets. You are looking at a live shot of the principal room. Uh, coming up, Josh Silverman, Etsy CEO, will be joining us at 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. So as we mentioned, oil falling though now bouncing back after OPEC Plus agreed to proceed with a January output hike. For more on this story, let's bring in Jeff Curry, Goldman Sachs Global Head of Commodities. Jeff, what do you make of the decision? Well, I think it makes a lot of sense in the current environment. I mean, one, there was a lot of tensions between um, with the U.S. administration that were highlighted by the SPR, coordinated SPR announcement you know, a few weeks ago. Second, it takes the pressure off the administration to cut a deal with Iran that would have provided barrels in you know, the first half of 22. And then third, um, the shale producers are budgeting right now for their CapEx programs for, for next year. So the net of this is means less spare capacity in OPEC and likely less shale or less Iranian oil. So it reinforces that medium to longer term supply driven bullish story. Um, but yeah, near term, it's a blow to sentiment and to fundamentals. But looking where prices are uh, relative to the underlying cost structure, um, it's pretty hard to argue they go much lower than where they are today. Yeah, but Jeff, it feels like if they really wanted to kind of throw a line to President Biden, they would have increased uh, production. Um, do you think that that was on the table before Omicron? 
Well, you know, I think the market had priced in, uh, you know, no production increase for the month of January. So the fact that they're increasing by 400 a day is above market expectations. Um, and I have a feeling, you know, all of this Omicron uncertainty developed over the course of the last week. You know, we we're down almost $15 a barrel in one week's time. One thing I want to emphasize here that made it much more vicious than what we've seen historically is that you had a negative gamma effect going on. There's very little liquidity in this market right now. The producers have to delta hedge the strikes at the different, or excuse me, the dealers have to hedge the strikes of where the producers hedge out. And as the market starts to follow, they have to sell more and more and more and more. Um, that amplified the magnitude of the sell-off. So at this point right now, it's pricing in you know, a disaster scenario around Omicron. You know, we estimate it's pricing in like no plane flying around the earth for the next um, three months. So you know, the market's yeah. overshot to the downside. So Jeff, where are we year end? Um, yeah, you know, I think at this point right now, you have a lot of investors take risk down because it's been a very good year in, in commodities. And you can see it in the liquidity and in, in the market overall. We would think that it wouldn't be until after the first of the year that you see risk come back into this market. Um, you know, the medium term story is very much intact. In fact, you could argue with the lower prices, it's even you know more positive than what it was before. Um, but near term, there's still a lot of uncertainty around, uh, you know, with the Omicron. Um, and I think the willingness for investors to come in and put high levels of risk on right now is pretty limited. You know, I would expect it to be a grind higher going into year end um, with the real potential upside after the first of the year. Hey, Jeff, I also wonder what's going to happen with volatility, because if anything that we know, we know that OPEC hates volatility. They want a stable oil price because it helps them really foresee what demand's going to be. If we continue to see the volatility that we've seen in oil, what kind of rhetoric or action do you think we may see from OPEC Plus? Well, I, I would argue you're developing a volatility vortex in, in many of these energy markets. As the liquidity drops off and you know, investors get discouraged in the space, that reinforces higher volatility. The higher volatility then discourages less investment and less liquidity. So it's just a v vicious cycle um, in terms of creating a higher level of volatility. Um, you know, the only way you're going to stop that volatility is through increased investment and increased liquidity through more investors coming into the space. Hmm. But the hurdle rate between Omicron and all the recent developments just gets pushed higher and higher. So, you know, it'll be difficult to tame the volatility as we go into the winter months. It probably won't be until we get to the backside of the winter sometime in March that you could really start to turn down the volatility. If you're in the United States and you're looking at the SPR release you just coordinated, would you conclude from today's reaction that, that it was a, it, it did work? Or is this something else happening here? That the, the, the Saudis want to turn the temperature down. They don't want this, this sort of relationship to continue in the way that it is. I'm just trying to understand the kind of the back channel here. Well, I mean, the, the SPR announcement right after it, the market rallied, and the market was still positive until you got the Omicron news. Once the Omicron news hit, um, that's when you created that vicious downdraft. Because you think about the immediate reaction is shut down borders, which impacts oil. In fact, we look at the two commodities that are hit the most here. It's oil and cocoa, the two that are sold in air, ones that you know, travel through jet, and cocoa is sold primarily in airports. So the commodities most exposed to international travel were the ones hit the hardest <laughs> here. Um, and so when we think about, you know, the SPR release, the market had shrugged it off, was rallying. I'd argue really what we're witnessing here is the uncertainty generated by Omicron, but also what made the downdraft so vicious is no liquidity, and then mm. you had a negative gamma effect on top of that. Um, all right, Jeff, before we let you go, um, we had uh, J.P. Morgan seeing 2023, $150 oil. Uh, Bank of America says we could see spikes next year to 120 for Brent. Um, what's your upside risk for next year? Oh, you know, the upside risk, I think, is substantial going in, into next year. Um, I think putting a number around it's very difficult uh, because there's going to be a lot of volatility for due to all the reasons we, we talked about. And right now, the market's repricing carbon. Um, in terms of thinking about where that equilibrium is, I think there's a lot of uncertainty. You know, in the 2000s, I threw out a lot of numbers. I just don't think you know, that's very useful throwing out. I'm gonna, the way I like to describe to our investors, 
get long, buckle your seatbelt, hang on for the ride. And if this last week didn't demonstrate to you why you have to have that seatbelt snug tightly, I don't know what else. You know, I'd argue, yeah, it's going to be a lousy sharp ratio, but the upside potential here, I think, is enormous. Hey, Jeff, really appreciate that analysis. Jeff Curry, Goldman Sachs, Global Head of Commodities Research. I love seatbelt things like that. All right, well, we'll continue the conversation on Commodities Edge uh, later today. We'll talk about OPEC, and it's also my conversation with Rasmus Bach-Nelson, uh, Trafigura's Global Head of Decarbonization, how the company's working on cutting carbon emissions from the shipping industry, which is one of the hardest sectors uh, to decarbonize. So really interesting stuff coming from him, and that's at 1 p.m. in New York Times, 6 p.m. Uh, in London. For now, we want to check in on the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Radhika Gupta. Thanks, Alex. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken warned of serious consequences if Russia makes a military move on Ukraine. Blinken met with his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov, today in Stockholm. The Kremlin says it sees a growing risk that Ukraine may attack Russian-backed separatists there. House Democrats have come out with a short-term spending bill to try to prevent a federal government shutdown this weekend. The bill would fund federal agencies through February the 18th and would have to pass both houses of Congress by midnight Friday. That will require cooperation from Senate Republicans who have the power to drag out the process. And Pfizer says it expects its coronavirus vaccine to hold up against the Omicron variant. Data on just how well it protects should be available within two to three weeks. There are some additional mutations, but the clinical significance of those mutations is unknown. So I think we really have to wait for the data. And I don't expect that uh, there is a significant drop. If there is a significant drop, then Pfizer has a playbook to develop a new vaccine. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Alex. All right, Ritika, let's stick with the virus news right now. President Biden's going to announce new actions to combat the coronavirus later today. Want to get the latest now, Joe Matthew, Bloomberg Washington correspondent. We get a little bit of the readout of what we're going to get. Walk us through some of the highlights. Yeah, look, the president's working with the tools he has here, Alex, and they will sound familiar as it's going to be at least a couple of more weeks before we have real data on this new variant. But the president did promise to speak today, and he will, from the National Institutes of Health just outside of the nation's capital here. Among the announcements that we expect is increased testing for those coming in from out of the country. We got a little bit of a preview on this earlier in the week. They'll need to show, people will need to show a negative test within a day of getting on an airplane to the U.S. There may also be a follow-on test required following three to five days and possibly a quarantine could be included there as well. But the president will also call for an extension in the mask mandate for trains and planes and other public federal spaces and will also call on private insurers to cover the cost of at-home testing. That's the bulk of what we expect to hear today. I was in the White House briefing room, Alex, yesterday when Dr. Fauci came out in front of the reporters to announce this first U.S. case of Omicron here. And even though we knew it was coming, we knew what he was going to announce, it came with a certain sense of drama. And when the president speaks today, the real job will be expressing confidence, but also maintaining calm, Alex. Joe, I'll pick up. Thank you very much indeed. Bloomberg's Joe Matthew joining us on what is happening in D.C. a little bit later on. You can, of course, catch Joe on Bloomberg Radio's Sound On weekdays at 5 p.m. New York time. Uh, the U.S. government is urging, of course, vaccinated Americans uh, to get their booster shots as the Omicron variant threatens, the, the, threatens to spread, basically. Let's look now at the science behind making these drugs and how they become more effective. Uh, Richard uh, Fihi, uh, Centra CEO, joins us now. Centra's software uh, is uh, basically helping to determine how many drugs are made, how they behave, and what happens in, the, in these different populations. William, thank you very much uh, indeed. Centara, obviously, uh, modeling all of this. Talk to me about what you see in front of you right now. We're worried that our current therapeutics, our current vaccines don't work well enough. What can you tell us? Yeah, thanks very much, Richard. Um, you know, Sitar is a company where we, uh, we model the uh, effect of drugs in the body. And when the pandemic came along, we created our vaccine simulator, which has received uh, an R&D 100 award. Uh, and, you know, what we use, to, we, we use that for is to look at the, uh, the dosing um, the size of the dose and the, the, the time between doses for different vaccines. We've calibrated it against lots of uh, clinical data. 
and we've shown that it's been pretty accurate so far for the existing vaccines. Uh, it's not surprising, I think, that uh, COVID is, has variants. I think it's still pretty early to, in, in terms of the science, in terms of what's, what Omicron is, is really like. Uh, but the, the simulation capability is there as, as if, if and when we have to develop new vaccines. I'd say that, uh, you know, one thing we say is, yeah. uh, you know, the idea that we need to take boosters is absolutely, uh, is absolutely shown by the software. Um, you know, it's, it's a very good recommendation that's gone out now. Yeah, and then to that point, um, do we know yet, and how do you help this answer, what, their, what drugs go best? Like, what vaccines work best together to pre create the best protection in general among COVID and then the variants? Yeah, we've done a, a lot of modeling recently looking at uh, combination vaccines. So what happens if you get uh, Moderna first and Pfizer second, or if you're outside the U.S. And, and you're looking at some of the other vaccines? And, you know, what we've seen is, number one, is uh, it's, it's a good idea. You know, uh, there, there's certainly no harm to it, and it's good from the standpoint of vaccine supply. Uh, but we've also seen some indication that it that is actually, uh, it, it's actually leads to a better immune response in, in some cases to take, uh, to, take to, to sort of mix the, 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 uh, the vaccines that you get in, in your different doses. In terms of just understanding the process of getting new formulations ready and out there uh, into arms, there are, and the scientists have been talking about this a great deal over the last 24, 48 hours, there are certain biological processes that cannot be sped up, i.e. this 100 days looks like it's fairly fixed. What is your sense of whether or not we could speed that process up, whether or not actually AI, whether or not modelling, biosimulation could help us accelerate some of these processes? Yeah, I'd say that the, uh, the development of these vaccines is almost a, a miracle in the, in the history of mankind, how fast this happened. So it's kind of amazing we're talking about, gee, 100 days and can we speed it up? But I would also say that the answer is, I mean, you, you know, there's a lot that's known about this disease right now and about the vaccines and their, their, uh, their mechanism of action. So, um, you know, w certainly, certainly modeling will help. Uh, we, we, we're already working on it. And, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of people around the world, uh, not just people working in pharma companies, but also our regulators looking at how to speed this up and, and deliver mm -hmm. new vaccines if they're needed. What I also think is interesting is we're learning uh, with the different variants how the vaccines interact with an individual's immune system. Like the patients in South Africa who did have the vaccine were also HIV positive and they reacted differently to different variants. How do you help us figure out how an individual can respond to a certain vaccine or a certain therapeutic? Yeah, that's a great question. So one of the things you can do with biosimulation is look at how, getting the right dose to the right patient. And when you do that, you're looking at what are the other factors that might affect the patient. So, you know, we've, we've looked a lot at uh, people of different ages, people with different uh, comorbidities. Uh, and we can certainly look at things like uh, what are, what's coming out of South Africa where, where you know, potentially some people who have been exposed to other viruses may, may, be, um, may be more susceptible to it. Uh, but I still think that, you know, the, you know Omicron's really only been discovered uh, fairly frequently, fairly recently, excuse me, and, and, and from a scientific standpoint, people are scrambling to, to, to find out what the real facts are here. So, you know, I think the good news is with biosimulation and with a lot of the tools that are available, we have a lot, we, have a lot we can bring to the, to the table here. But, um, you know, this is going to play out over the next few weeks as we get more and more data about this new variant. One of the critical things we're still trying to understand is how regulators will deal with new versions of the vaccines. It looks like it's going to be uh, a similar playbook to the one we use for flu. But what can biosimulation do in terms of allowing regulators to smooth this process? Well, you know, one of the, one of the interesting things right now is it's very difficult to do large-scale clinical trials on new COVID vaccines because so many people have been vaccinated. So with biosimulation, we can start to ask questions about, you know, are these new vaccines, will they have different effects in different populations of people such as children or elderly, or like I said, like we were talking before about people with different comorbidities. Um, and, you know, we can get at that a lot faster than trying to, trying to organize a trial of, you know, tens of thousands of people that, that, that is increasingly getting quite difficult just to find patients to do that. All right, William, thanks a lot. We really appreciate it. William Fire, uh, Satera, CEO, thank you very much for the insight. This is Bloomberg.
It's time for the Bloomberg Business Flash to look at some of the biggest business stories in the news right now. I'm Rishka Gupta. Apple has a problem it wasn't expecting. With the iPhone 13, Bloomberg said the company has told suppliers that demand for its newest device has weakened. It's a signal that some consumers have decided against trying to get the hard to find them. Apple has already cut its iPhone 13 production goal because of a lack of parts. China is on the verge of lifting an almost three-year grounding of the Boeing 737 MAX. Chinese regulators have lifted the last safety-related obstacle to bringing the MAX back, issuing an airworthiness directive. China was the first country to ground the plane back in 2019 after two fatal crashes, and it is the world's second largest aviation market. The top bosses at Goldman Sachs have come to believe they're not getting paid enough. They're looking for ways to boost their eight-digit pay packages. Amongst the ideas voted to reward CEO David Solomon and his deputies getting a cut of the richest rewards thrown off by Goldman's own blank check companies. They've also pressured for incentive packages and had some success. And that is your latest business flash. Guy Alex. All right, thanks so much, Ritika. So, Guy, I found this story by, uh, by Sid Narayan fascinating. Um, now, we might look at it and say, yeah, okay, whatever, they want more money, ha ha. But in actuality, uh, these banks are losing a lot of talent and high-end management talent uh, to go run hedge funds or go in private equity where the pay is astronomically different. Um, and this is a real kind of competitive job, landscape, wage inflation scenario. It is, but think about where it started as well. It started with junior bankers, particularly Goldman yeah. Sachs junior bankers, and then it spread elsewhere. Uh, and what we saw was the lower ranks getting a biggest piece of the pie I think it was only inevitable at some point that we would see the senior ranks maybe making the same point. But I think your, your points about uh, effectively kind of buy side, sell side are well founded. Uh, and I think if you work for a big publicly uh, listed um, uh, sort of sell side company, maybe you're actually looking at what is happening on the buy side and going, I want a piece of that pie. I think we need to jack things up a bit here. Well, especially when you're in executive management and your pay is disclosed and you're going to get heat from, uh, you know, Washington, D.C., or you're going to have to go testify and get heat from your pay package, et cetera, um, that's going to be very different. And then there was a great um, anecdotal evidence in the story that uh, James Gorman and Morgan Stanley uh, said he was going to take a pay cut the same time that David Solomon was going to get a pay increase. And so they had to put that off. And then you had the COVID that happened. So there's just there's, there's a lot in there. And we saw Greg Lemcal leave. I never thought I'd see that happen. Yeah, I'd be interested to know what Elizabeth Warren's attitude to this. In Yay! fact, I know what Elizabeth Warren's attitude to all yeah. of this is going to be. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll see if other firms follow suit, well, I think. I, yeah. um, it is unsurprising at this point to me, post the, post the junior bankers saga, that this is happening. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a, that's a really good point. And just take a look at the overall market situation. What I also find interesting is just how well certain equities are holding up. I mean, you have a flatter curve, but financials are still doing well uh, here in the U.S. Let's talk about what is happening over here in Europe as we head towards the close. We've got around 35 minutes before the end of trading here in Europe. We are seeing some ripple into the tech sector as a result of what is happening with Apple. ASML in the chip sector down today. Deliveroo in the delivery space. That's interesting given what we're seeing with Omicron. Maybe actually the recent rise uh, and the uh, return to sort of stay at home stocks begin to unwind a little bit. Aston Martin losing its CFO. The market reacting really violently to that. Coming up on the European close, Hugh Gimber is going to be joining us. Looking forward to that. That conversation. This is Bloomberg.